Hello and welcome back to White Lines Football. Lewis here today. I'm joined by international footballer Jamie Bossio. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good, mate. And you? Brilliant. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. So, if the viewers don't know, uh, the reason we know each other is because you were obviously at our school helping us teach sociology. So, um, that was yeah. a that was a good experience. But obviously, quite a few people around the school knew you for your uh, international things, and people started so, sort of started to follow your career. And I thought I'd just ask you a few questions. So. You've got your own Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make that, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I learned off that. You were born in Ireland, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Born in Dublin when I was... Well, about, lived there for about eight years. Yeah? Yeah. It was nice growing up there. Played for... Well, my first ever club was uh, Home Farm Everton. Okay. In Dublin. And then that's where quite a lot of decent footballers actually have come from that club. All so right. I was lucky enough. Kind of the, the coaching that they had was quite good as well. Players like yeah, Robbie Keane started out there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Among a few others. So, yeah, I lived in Dublin for eight years. My parents were living there at the time. And I was born there. So that's where it all kind of started for me. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's good. So, obviously, uh, you said about your first club and sort of Robbie Keane played for them as well. But I, I sort of wondered, how did you actually get into football? Is it sort of uh, parents into it or just playing with your friends, that sort of thing? No, I think it's just parent influence as well. My dad always used to big fan of football massive Liverpool fan so it was kind of like yeah. you're into it really if you if you grow up watching it I suppose so by yeah, the age yeah. of four I was already playing for a team in a way it turned out quite well <laughs> yeah yeah definitely definitely um, I think it's fair to say it has worked out well uh, you said you left Ireland when you were eight so yeah. um, where did you go from there? well we moved over to uh, Leicester my dad, my dad got a job in a hospital there and we moved over to Leicester and uh, <laughs> that's where I was like, literally start out straight away in the academy I went to a uh, Peterborough United. I was at Peterborough for a year and then I was at Leicester for another year before I moved back. We moved over to Gibraltar again, but yeah, that was really good. It was, I was about eight to ten playing there under the academies, playing against big teams, Arsenal at the time, Norwich, teams out travelling away from home on strict like diets and training regimes and everything else. It was quite cool. So how, how old did you say you were at that point? I was about eight, eight, nine and ten, yeah, but to the age of ten. So you're on a strict diet when you're eight years old then? Yeah, yeah. Strict training, homework as well that you yeah. had to do. But that kind of academy kind of lifestyle was, was really good, to be honest. As well at the time, Peter, uh, Matty Ebrington and Simon Davis had just signed for Spurs, so there was quite a little buzz around the club. Yeah, yeah. Because they'd gone for, well, at the time, that was something good money. The uh, problem with Peter is that they then went into administration, they were going about to go into administration, they had to lose either the, the academy or the, the team in the, at the time they were in League One. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, they had to ditch the academy, and that's when I went to Leicester City for the year, for about eight months more or less. So you were uh, you were at Peterborough, and then you sort of you were told the academy was going. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was like they were cutting all the all the junior teams, and it was just a matter of we had to go find someone else to play. Okay, fair enough. Did you get scouted by Leicester then, or did you sort of? Well, it's because we lived in the area. Because we lived in the area, and I told them that I'd been playing for Peterborough, they just took me on. So. Okay. Okay. Was, I was there for about yeah, eight months as well before then we came back to live in Gibraltar. Did you have uh, any involvement with the first team at all? I mean, I know you were young, but did you sort of look around the stadiums, that sort of thing? Um, not so much Leicester, but Peter as well. They'd like get us in ball boys and yeah, yeah. We, we used to go down to London Road whenever we wanted, really. They'd just give us the tickets to the game and we'd go down. So, yeah, I tried to be involved as much as I could with the club and kind of experience the seniors as much as I could when Barry Fry was the manager and everything else. Yeah, so yeah. they're a good family club, but the problem they they kind of lost it all, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, I mean now Peterborough, I think they're quite they're quite known for bringing up young players, and they're known for looking into long non league sort of things. So it seems like they've really sorted out now. But I suppose at the time, like you said, being involved with the first team and the training regime at the time, uh, at eight years old, that's sort of not starting nice and early for you then. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You experience it at a young age, and you really want to kind of push on and experience it even more. Unfortunately for me, I came back to Gibraltar at the time. If not, I, who knows? I could have maybe carried on there, or the circumstances were indifferent. So, like we said, you play for Gibraltar. You play uh, uh, semi-pro football, is it in Gibraltar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're playing semi-pro football. Obviously, you love the game. You stayed in it, but um, obviously, like I said earlier on, you've you're now a qualified teacher. So, um, is that something you always wanted to do? Or was that like an alternative to uh, football sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, it was. I, as soon as I came over to Gibraltar, you don't really, you didn't really think you're going to live off football anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, because when I came back and everything else, we hadn't got into UEFA until about 2012, 2013. So 
before then it was amateur football here in Gibraltar. These people weren't being paid. Yeah. Now the league is semi-pro. There are teams that are, they've got players that are full-time that all they do is football. Mm-hmm. So there's some professional clubs, there's some semi-pro clubs. Yeah. My age now, really, I'm 25. I can't really be looking to go anywhere else. So mm-hmm. teaching is it's something that I enjoy because it's interaction with people, it's interaction with the kids as well. They like the whole football thing and it's really mm-hmm. good. If I was a bit younger when this happened, maybe I would look yeah. to go play abroad or do something else, but... It's a shame, but yeah. Anyway, I'm just trying to enjoy it as well as much as possible now. So. Yeah, I, I remember when um, when you were at our school with us in sociology, everyone was sort of asking you about football constantly, not focusing on the work. But um, what age did you move to Gibraltar? So you went from Ireland to England to Gibraltar. Yeah, when I was ten, when we were ten, well, yeah, when I was ten, we moved back to Gibraltar. Yeah, I was playing with a local team, Glasses United, until literally till I was probably about twenty years old. So mm. ten years with one with one club. Um, obviously went back to the UK when I went to university and everything else mm-hmm. and then now I'm back here for the first time I think in five years so did you originally want to do football or was it always a sort of point where you realized it wasn't going to be a professional sort of thing because of your age or was there a certain point where you realized okay I'm gonna to have to go through an alternative route here because it's not going to work or did you sort of always know that no well it was always going to be difficult when you come back to Gibraltar because obviously we're not on the map as a massive football country either no. Yeah. Uh, lots of people do go over to Spain to play, but the, the lower leagues in Spain aren't that. They're not as competitive or they're not as good mm-hmm. as the, the lower leagues in the UK. It was just a matter of just seeing what happens, and then obviously the, the university came along with the job that followed. And but football's always been kind of there as well throughout the whole thing. So I've yeah. tried to keep it as serious as I can, and it's it's working for me, I suppose, at the moment. It's hard when you're, when you're working every single day of the week and then you're training every single day of the week as well. It's quite tiring, but you have to kind of balance your life, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I suppose being busy is always good, though, because you're doing two things you love and you're sort of balancing it and making a living off it at the same time, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does have its rewards. You say you're working every day. Uh, what are you currently doing then, teaching-wise? Yeah, now I'm teaching in the, the secondary school, the boys' secondary school here. We've got two secondary schools in Gibraltar, a girls' school and a boys' school. Okay. So I'm in the boys' school, I'm teaching English, I'm doing a bit of sociology as well, so... I'm enjoying myself. First year of work, well, full-time work, I suppose. So, yeah. getting used to it slowly, but enjoying it at the same time. Yeah, that's that's the main thing, enjoying it, really. So, like I said, you taught us sociology. Do you have any memories from that? Anything that stands out around the mark? The rain mark was nice. I liked it, actually. Yeah. Um, shame it was cut short. It was only a couple of months. But, mm. no, I would I would have loved to stay there a few more, a few more months. But they had to send me off to a second placement school. But no, yeah, you guys were great. It's a shame I didn't get the chance to actually go on and teach you yeah. more. But um, anyway, it was a good, good, good few months now. Yeah, people around school. I mean, I've just left now at the end of year thirteen. But uh, long after you went, people still talking about you, talking about you. Um, obviously, your international game sort of thing. People are still, still quite a popular figure <laughs> around there, even though you're not actually there in person anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I've still um, is, is Gareth Price still there as well? Yeah, 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 he's still there, yeah. Yeah, yeah he sends me a message every now and again. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. But no, he used to give me the lifts into into school. <laughs> yeah, because you, you used to do a bit, a bit of PSHE, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Moving on to the international stage, which is sort of a big part of your career I suppose obviously you said you were born in Ireland so you had the choice to pay, play for Ireland or Gibraltar I mean being a semi-pro footballer I, I mean I don't, think much, I don't think it was much of a choice really yeah. I, I was never going for Ireland but yeah. anyway yeah. whoever wrote that quite quite generous yeah I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say sort of being a semi-pro rather than a pro was that was that a decision or was that just you just knew straight away I guess yeah no that's just something that happened I suppose it, that was something that if fell into that I was going to be a semi professional I wouldn't mind playing for Ireland but yeah. I don't think Martoni was going to call me anytime soon to be fair <laughs> I think it was basically the choice of if you wanted to play international football it had to be Gibraltar really then yeah 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 yeah, yeah and the way that things were moving anyway here yeah, back at home when the whole UEFA thing was happening and then clubs were being accepted into UEFA competitions and everything yeah. else that was um, that was good playing for Gibraltar is quite nice as well the people are very appreciative of what you do and yeah because we're such a small community and everyone knows everyone and the fans speak to you constantly so no it's good in the sort of World Cup qualifying I mean um, not not in the harshest way but obviously uh, lose most games I suppose you put it that way the fans sort of respect what you're doing sort of thing for, for the area yeah yeah yeah, no, no. yeah so overall um, 
I mean, how, how many how many uh, caps do you have for Gibraltar now? Got nine nine caps, I think. Nine, nine? yeah, nine caps. Mm-hmm. So overall, what what's it like playing for them? It must be a really good experience representing somewhere you feel so passionate about. Yeah, no, you can't you can't imagine um, how difficult it is, <laughs> and the, the leap and the jump from like local, playing in the local league here to then playing against ridiculous players. Yeah, but yeah. Time before that have been full-time professionals all their lives and it's for us it's really difficult honestly mm. but it's that we well you can you only have to en- you, you, can, you have to enjoy it really you can't dwell on the fact that they're going to be much much better than you anyway but we go out to try and enjoy it as much as possible and um, the results have been they've been okay considering we're quite a new nation really mm, yeah like we've been on the end of an, a 13 nil thumping for example like San Marino have against the Germans and everything else so we're new but we haven't been disrespected completely really yeah we, yeah like, for example we play germany we lose 7-0 well that's kind of expected of the, the mm. champion of the world you know what i mean so mm. we are doing what we can with the resources and the amount of us that there are because there's only a population of thirty thousand people so yeah. we're very very small in comparison to even some of the other smaller nations as well we're slowly slowly but surely getting better uh, and the results are there to see it and some other results don't even show it up properly because there's some games where we give teams a decent run out and then we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot and yeah. concede sloppy, sloppy goals for example like the last the last game against Bosnia we were um, I think it was 2-0 down at half time the game finished 4-0 but like the game was 3-0 for the majority of the game we gave away a silly goal in the 90th minute and then it goes from 3-0 to 4-0 it looks a bit more yeah uh, the scoreline doesn't really reflect it. So, but there's some games now where we're, we're starting to compete amongst the, the smaller nations. Mm. Really, like um, last year, we got a point against Liechtenstein, got a point before against Estonia. We've beaten Malta, so we are slowly improving. We are starting to score goals. We are starting to attack more. Mm. We are keeping the longer periods of time than we were before. So, for us, it's not like going from losing to winning. It's kind of it, we're still losing, but we're, the way we're playing is is much much better. In, yeah. When you look at the statistics and the numbers and the figures, we're, we're focusing on more. And we're using the, the statistics to help us improve our game, which is something that the manager's been trying to instill in us. Really, play percentages and get better in that sense. Like, you know, you're not going to beat a Germany, you're not going to beat a Portugal, but you can try and compete in certain aspects. Like last, when we played Germany in the second game, we were one 0 down at half time. Mm. but we've been 1-1 one, one. like we had a, a, some of our chances as well which is not taking them so for us it's like if we can score a goal that's an improvement from last year mm-hmm. like that's why there were so many at the scenes there were when we scored our first competitive goal at Hamden Park to equalise against the Scots small little things at the moment which will hopefully eventually get us that kind of first competitive point I suppose in the, in the qualifying groups in comparison to San Marino, I mean, I've noticed watching uh, little clips of games that you're sort of having more shots and that sort of thing. And when people say with San Marino, like, s- stereotypically, they're sort of the whipping boys. But with Gibraltar, no one really speaks of them like that. I mean, people know that the results aren't great, but no one sort of associates them with that. And I remember you saying yeah. again, like uh, saying to me when you were at Arena Mark, you were trying to mark, I think it was Sammy Kadira from a corner. It's just impossible to mark. He just runs through you. and <laughs> Like, yeah. say you're 1-0 down at half-time against Germany, and they're 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 like strong professionals there on thousands of pounds a week and that's actually not yeah. bad for a nation your size sort of thing yeah they're the world champions as well at the time it's exactly. like when our keeper saves a penalty uh, our fireman goalkeeper saves a penalty from Freinsteiger like <laughs> kind of got a lot really yeah so obviously playing for Gibraltar is a lot of travelling what's that like um, no it's alright it's um, well we kind of get the leave off our jobs and we just go we live like the life of a professional for a few a few weeks well yeah. not really a week for a, day, a few days it's quite nice we travel well the majority of the time we train in between we train in the stadium the night before the hotels are really good and so we have good security wherever we go you kind of live the life of a footballer for like uh, five six days and then you come back and say i'm back to back to work does that does that cause problems i mean being a teacher i mean i suppose it's quite vital that the teacher's present but does your school have any problems with that if you're going away to play for the country no, no, no. the school's quite supportive of me to be fair and okay. what i do because it like the, the boys really really like the fact that i play for gibraltar if we come back and i play crap they'll give me stick if i come back and I play well they'll, they'll be like oh well played you played for so the school's really supportive of what i do because it benefits 
the way I teach the boys. So um, they don't mind at all. Well, I do. I'll just leave my work and they get on with it anyway when I'm away. But yeah, the school's quite supportive with me. Yeah, I suppose that does sort of increase the bond. I mean, when we're not even from Gibraltar here in England and we sort of helped you bond with us as well as a sort of teacher role because that's like, something you can relate to sort of thing. So when playing for Gibraltar, I mean, you mentioned uh, you try and score a goal, try and keep the ball more, that sort of thing. Have you ever sort of, have you ever sort of been sitting in the dressing room and the, you've ever thought we could win this or we want to set out to win or do you have a certain aim and an end goal? Well, the, well, the game we played, what game was it? We played we played Estonia once in this, this last qualifying group, and we played Cyprus already once. Mm-hmm. And the score lines, both of them don't reflect the game whatsoever. Mm-hmm. The first one was against Estonia. We played we played away from home. We were nil nil at half time. Literally, we we came out second half. We weren't switched on, and we conceded. And then they went on to score a couple more. But that that game didn't reflect. We deserved something from that. And then the Cyprus game we played last November. We were one nil down half time. We equalised in the second half, and then for long periods of that second half, we were all over them. Yeah, we were unlucky not to get the the two one. I think if we scored the two one there, we go on to at least take something from the game. Yeah, but it turned. It went the other way. They scored and then finished three one. And again, the scoreline doesn't really reflect reflect what's happening at the moment. So we're unlucky. Like against yeah. Belgium, Bosnia teams like that, you never. You're not really going to get results but if we're competing with teams like Estonia competing with teams like Cyprus that shows us that we're getting better as well what was the final score in the Estonia game then that you spoke about I think it, ended, it finished 4-0 okay. I think. but it was 0-0 half time yeah. really, they only had like 4 shots on goal so yeah. it doesn't really reflect what we did the whole first half and part of the second half too so it's a shame is it Ragnar Klavan did he play in that game yeah, he was playing. <laughs> I suppose that's good for you then, being a Liverpool fan, that sort of thing. Yeah, he's, he's not, he wasn't that great, to be fair. Really? Yeah, no, I thought he was all right, but they had a few <laughs> decent midfield players. Yeah. Um, But Clavan was quite simple. Yeah. Literally got the ball, knock it forward, down to the channel, and that was it. All right, okay, fair enough. Where, what position did you play in that game? I was playing front of the back four, uh, back five. Yeah, just holding holding midfield. Yeah. In front of the back five. Do you, is that a position you normally play? Because you, you could play in defence, am I right in saying that? I played, my actually my debut for the national team was at left back. Yeah. Against Croatia a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was June 7th. June the 7th, yeah. 2015, that was my debut against Croatia. And, they, and I came, and the call-ups I was receiving before that were for, to, to go in at left back. Mm-hmm, yeah. I yeah. played at left back, I played at holding midfield, I can play at centre-back wherever I'm kind of like a polyfiller they just mm-hmm. bring me in and play yeah. which is good I suppose I know I tagged you in it on Twitter but last summer there was this thing that Gillingham were looking at you did you know anything about that or was that just a pure rumour because that was a, as a left back I think no no I didn't I didn't really know anything I heard about the rumour but I thought someone just made it up okay. but no to be honest wherever I play I just give up my best really yeah was that um, when you said you came at left back was that because I know you both play five at the back was that as a left wing back or was that a four at the back game yeah, yeah, left wing back, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so like you said, uh, well, not said, but you showed me um, on Twitter. You sent me pictures of shirts you swapped with players. Um, yes. One of the one of them that uh, stick out to me was Andre Gomez. I mean, I was watching uh, the Copa del Rey final yeah. last night, and I saw him, and I was like, "That's weird to think because you swapped shirts with him." He was great last night. He wasn't playing in midfield. He was playing like right back, I think, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Or- Strange. Yeah, quite, quite. Like Barcelona have had their problems at right back. To be fair, they've sort of chucked in anyone they can at points. When you swap shirts with him, uh, we'll, yeah. go, we'll go on to the game in a minute. Did you approach him? Did you have anyone specific you wanted to go to? Because I know Ronaldo was injured, but Ronaldo was out. Yeah, no, we kind of just went into the tunnel and did it there. Okay. Oh, it was just a matter of trying to get anyone's shirt really because of oh, it was the first time that they played as European champions and the shirt has like the European champions badge. It's got the date with our game and our name. Mm. So yeah. I thought, really, I just wanted to get anyone. And when I turned around and I saw him, I thought, well, I'll we'll ask him. And then I realised after that he, he was the one that Barcelona had signed for 50 million euros. Yeah. Uh, so that's not bad. And actually, uh, he came on in the game and I came on in the game. And we came on literally at the same time. Yeah. And I remember him going to take a shot outside the area. And I literally clipped his, his ankle as he was about to shoot. It was, a, it was 100% definitely a foul. Yeah. Referee didn't give it, but he was then subbed off after that 
Really? <laughs> and, he was out, and he was out for two two to three weeks after. Really? Yeah. And all, and all the kids in school when I got back were like, oh, you, you injure him? Because <laughs> there's a big Barcelona fan base here in Gibraltar. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, oh, you've injured him? He's out for two, three weeks and he's a new signing and, and then you've got the cheek to get his shirt. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what makes it even better yeah I mean being close to Spain I suppose it is quite a Barcelona fan base but did you um, I know it's a bit maybe a bit cheeky to say this but did you feel a bit of pride like you you know you're the one that done it sort of thing yeah yeah I did actually even though it sounds really bad but I was like yeah yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm the one in the news <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you said it was the first game after they were European champions talk to us about that game how you felt uh, before it and stuff like that well no cause we, we went to we went up to we played in Porto Mm-hmm. Uh, because they, they, I think they wanted a big game and they came back and they showed off their new trophy and everything else. It was quite amazing, really. Um, and they treat us really well, to be fair. Mm. Um, the, the stadium was completely full. And basically, it was just a party for them. Yeah. It was nice to be for us to be the guests at the party. So, <laughs> yeah. Can't blame. To be able to say that you played against Germany as the world champions and to be able to play against Portugal their first ever game as the European champions for the first time something amazing it's a shame that Ronaldo wasn't there imagine if he was playing it would have been even worse <laughs> like the fact you said you play in front of the defence and he was he sort of plays up front more for Portugal so you'd have been right involved with him really yeah yeah I know <laughs> shame but one of those things you can, you'd can, you want to play against even though we probably cause absolute chaos you'd want to play against him to say that you've been able to play against one of the best players in the world ever so yeah. it's a shame maybe next time yeah, I was, I was going to say, would you? Was it sort of a relief you weren't playing against him, or was it sort of you were gutted that you weren't? I suppose it's more gutted that you weren't really. Yeah, I think everyone was. Everyone was wanted him to play uh, to to be able to say that you played against Ronaldo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Other other countries that probably play against them, they obviously don't want him to play because it's it's a normal thing because they're all professionals. Yeah. But for us, it's like oh shame he's not playing. Yeah. Yeah. And fight to get his shirt at the end, probably. Skip as priority though, so he, he would have got it. Like you say, as a semi pro player or just a football fan as well, it must be an honour to play against those sort of players and to be playing against the current world champions and European champions is a great story to have in the back of your mind, despite what the results no. might have been. Yeah, and the, like you, you put the list of players that I've played against in the space of two years, and it's ridiculous to think that. Mm. Play, played against them like watching watching Hazard yes in the FA Cup final like every time I got the ball I was like crap I played against him you know what I mean it's, yeah yeah it's weird it's weird and Ozil and everyone else it's it's strange but no it's something that when you finish eventually because football's a short thing it doesn't mm. last for your whole career you only play about 10 years so I want to try and make the most of it and then at the end you have all these fond memories that you can look back on so have you had conversations with a lot of the best players in the world then? Like, did you talk to Hazard at all? That sort of thing? I mean, um, shaking hands. No, I didn't really, didn't really speak to Hazard. Just handshake and nice to meet you and that was it. Yeah. Um, the Ger- actually, the Germans, when we played them the second time, uh, when I made my competitive debut, I came on and got... We went to we went to the change room after the game. They invited us into the change room. All right. Yeah, so we kind of did our swapping of the shirts and everything else in there and it, they were just so chilled out and quite kind of laid back and cool about everything. Uh, like, Podolski was like sat there with those all playing some random German music. Yeah. And Sherl and a few others, but like, the, yeah, we'd just talk and how it just like, as if they were normal people, it was really strange. Yeah. They did, kind of, they respected us and they respected what we do and they respect that it, for us it's difficult because of the circumstances that we're under and everything else. So, that was like one of the things that sticks in my mind as one of the moments that I'll remember for quite a long period of time. Like I said, despite the results, I mean, it's always going to stick with you. Like, you're going to, as a football fan, I mean, even when you're a lot older, you're going to sort of remember back in the day and people are going to be talking about, the, like, in the history books, obviously, Germany being world champions, Portugal uh, being European champions, and it's a fact that you've played against them and you're always going to know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just sounds insane. Uh, going on swapping shirts, you also swapped with Divock Origi. Did you want to go to him? I mean, being a Liverpool fan. Yes. Yeah, I. <laughs> there's a funny story to that as well because the game had finished. I was subbed off, um, and as soon as the game finished, I went towards their bench because he didn't play, mm-hmm. and he was stood there beside uh, Lukaku. Lukaku was in front of him, and I walked towards him, and Lukaku, like, stretched out his arm to give me his shirt. And I'd kind of like brushed him aside and said, no, I don't want yours, I want Divock Origi, who stood beside you. So, 
he was a bit like I kind of like mugged him off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you mugged off Lukaku. <laughs> yeah, so thinking about the amount of money that Lukaku was going to go for, I should have actually taken his. I could have made quite a bit on eBay. But, yeah. <laughs> but no, no, I went up to Origi and I kind of just had a kind of brief chat with him about Liverpool and everything else. I was like, yeah, I'm just I'm a big fan and everything else. And they're playing United the weekend after. Mm-hmm. Said to him, please, please score a goal against United and keep scoring goals again. He's like, yeah, no, I'll try my best. Hopefully, I can play. And that was really nice. But yeah, Lukaku wasn't impressed. Got his shirt to kind of give it to me. I said, no, no, I just want, to, I want to swap with Divock. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you're, um, you made him angry that day? And ever since he's been on a rampage in the Premier League because of that, that might moment. Be, well, that might be it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. So I mean, I don't want to put a damper on it, but I watched the, uh, I watched the game on TV and. Um, that early goal from Benteke, uh, yeah, what was going, me. what was going through your mind at that moment? Because I think was it your <laughs> pass that got intercepted? It was my ball. Yeah. Did nice. you feel responsible? Good to start after seven seconds, isn't it? <laughs> Did you feel responsible? Or was it just a oh, sort yeah, of yeah. these things and happen? I, I get grief from the kids every single day still. Oh really? They just shout Benteke in the corridors and stuff like that. Yeah. But, no, it's I don't know. It's one of those things. You just. Maybe a bit. Oh, I was a bit overawed by everything when you look literally just kicking off and you're looking at the people you're on the other side of the pitch. Mm. And I don't know. I don't know. It's just one of those things, really uh, hard to recover from in a game. Yeah. But I, anyway, I can take credit for Benteke's turn of form. So you're, you're responsible for Benteke's form and Lukaku's form now. So uh, yeah, yeah. Good. One of the kids said to me, uh, "Oh, sir, thank you really. Thank, thank you so much for giving him uh, the Benteke the assist because." It meant that my uh, my card that I have on FIFA went up to, went up in value and I sold them on for much more. So, <laughs> team of the week or something you got a blue, <laughs> blue Benteke. I was watching it on TV because I sort of I didn't plan to watch it, but I was flicking through the channels and I was like, oh, Gibraltar were playing. Like, I wonder if I wonder if uh, Mr. Bossy I was. I know he was playing, and I sort of looked at the lineup. I was like, oh, he is, and I sort of saw you at the beginning, and then I was like, okay, kick off. And it was was it was it it was, it was a home game, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 and I think. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but the um, the quality of the camera or something was wrong. I couldn't really work out exactly who the players were, and I sort of saw the pass intercepted, and I was like, is that? And I saw the replay, I was like, oh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I get continuous grief for that. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up again. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just, thought, I just wanted, to, wanted to ask you about it, because I saw and I just thought about it. But um, That's all right, I have a world record now anyway. It's one of the quickest goals ever. <laughs> And you've got the assist. <laughs> yeah, I've got the assist for it, so at least I can claim an assist. I never get one. Speaking of the big players you played against, who who do you think is the? Or oh, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll stick my head out of the sand and say who's the best player you've played against with your time at Gibraltar. Oh, that's a difficult one. To <laughs> the way when we played against when that in that game Belgium, the way that Eden Hazard moves mm. on and off the ball is you is unbelievable. Like. Yeah. You don't think that he works that hard for the team. Mm. He was literally on it. The change of pace that he has as well is sublime. Like the way he drifts past you, you can't even get near him. Like I've, someone, someone took a picture of me trying to mark him in yeah. the game because he dropped deep to receive the ball and then tripled. Like literally the same way he plays against Arsenal yesterday and he does every week in the Premier League. He does exactly the same to Belgium. Mm. And you can't stop him. You can't. He's up there and. Ozil as well was ridiculous when we played against them. Like he one side, he'd, we'd be on one side of the pitch, then he'd be down the middle, then he'd be on the other side, and he'd just drift. And the way that he kind of glides with the ball at his feet is unreal. Yeah. So them two kind of stand out mm-hmm. massively. And Lewandowski wasn't bad to be fair. Oh really? <laughs> he was all right. Yeah, I suppose he's decent. <laughs> yeah, he's just he's just average. Yeah. Uh, some of the Portugal players. Nanny was Nanny was awesome mm-hmm. as well. Like built like a brick house. Can't get the ball off him. Uh, on my debut, played against Mandzukic as well. Oh really? Yeah. Gave away That's a penalty actually on my debut against Mandzukic. Oh, did you? It wasn't, it wasn't a penalty though. He was a diver, and I told him. Oh really? Uh, yeah. If you, actually, if you look it up on YouTube, yeah. second second half, it's like. The ball's crossed in, he, I like, lean into him and he like jumps up in the air as if I've kind of nudged him out after he's headed the ball over the bar and the ref gives a pen. Really? <laughs> I gave away a pen and a booking on my on my debut. It was a handful to play against, to be fair. Do you get that a lot in the sort of international level? Do you get the people diving quite a lot? No, not really, not really. But he was a bit over the top, I think. Perisic as well played on the right wing. Mm-hmm. When he was cut, he came off the bench and I was like looking, I was like, please don't come onto my wing. <laughs> and he literally just walked over and I, I just, oh. 
No, he was he was awesome. And now he's linked with a move to the Premier League as well. So. Yeah, uh, Manchester United apparently in talks, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Him, Bernardo Silva as well, who looks like he's about to sign for City. Yeah, yeah, has been confirmed, been, I think, for City now as well, yeah. Played against him. So, no, it's nice to say that he played against all these amazing players, really. I mean, when, obviously... So sort of when you're a fan watching Hazard, you're like, oh, he's good, like he's very f- fancy with the ball. But I mean, when you're actually there, it's so much different, really, sort of thing. Yeah, it's strange because you kind of, when you're shaking, you're walking across the pitch and you're shaking hands with them, it's like, oh, like I'm playing against these guys. But then as soon as the referee kind of blows a whistle, it's like just another game of football. Mm-hmm. It's really, really weird. You can't, it's very difficult to describe. We played in Poland um, and we were playing literally in front of 50,000 people. The referee blows a whistle, but then all of a sudden all the fans and all the noise it's just like a buzz you can't hear anything it's like a buzz in the back of your head but you can hear everything that's going on on the pitch you zone into the game and that's it it's it's strange it's a strange feeling because you think well how am I not hearing what these people are saying in the stands when there's 50,000 of them yeah yeah it's it's weird it's weird what is the biggest stadium you've played at? I think it was that one yeah the the national stadium in, in, in Warsaw the Polish stadium it was awesome Okay, yeah. Like heats, heats, everything. Yeah. Had the full works. But the most impressive stadium we've been to, I didn't play, but um, like uh, the Aviva in Ireland or Hamden Park, was, those are impressive stadiums. Yeah. Nick's Fierce as well were really, really good. Going back to the quality of the players, I mean, did, did Pepe play when you played against Portugal? Yeah, he did. Yeah. I know you were more of a defensive player yourself, but seeing. Uh, what you think? What a football fan would stereotypically think of a defender, sort of head it, kick it. Is it? Is it? It's sort of different with the professional centre backs. Like you don't, you wouldn't really think about it, but it's just so different how strong they are, sort of thing. Yeah, no, like Pepe. It was Pepe playing with Bruno Alves, the two of them. Yeah, and it's like there's no way our little <laughs> centre forward was just about <laughs> five foot ten. Yeah, going to win a ball against Pepe in the air. Else we played Toby, Toby Alderweireld. Oh really? Top- they played against Belgium, against Belgium against yeah. Uh, caught one goal. It's like you can't imagine these these guys how how I don't know how fit how strong they are. Yeah, well, they've been doing it all their lives. Really, they don't have to work. They just train, eat right, do everything that they need to do to become professional footballers. So for us to be able to compete with them, it's it's nice, but it's so so difficult. Like you said about Nanny, like built like a brick. But I mean, from a fan's perspective, you wouldn't necessarily think like you'd more associate with him pace and skill, but. Because he is a professional footballer, he is unbelievably strong, and you've got to cope with that sort of thing. Yeah, even even Eden Hazard is like five foot, but he's so stocky, and you can't move him off the ball. Yeah, and like there's a goal that he scored I think this season against Arsenal, where he went from midfield and ran, and then just brushed Cochrane aside as if he was yeah. nothing. Yeah, imagine playing against that that power, that pace mm. for someone who's so small as well with such a low centre of gravity. It's so difficult. Mm. But yeah. like I said, we well we're never expected to stop Eden Hazard anyway, so. It's just nice to be able to play against him. So what what would the manager sort of say to you then? I mean, you say you weren't expected to stop it in Hazard. What would, it, would he single him out and what would he say? Just deal with him the best you can? Yeah, I don't think it's about singling him out because at the end of the day, they're all full-time professionals and they're all very, yeah. very good. So it's kind of creating your own game plan and then trying... It seems like Belgium, it's trying to keep the score down as much as possible and to keep them frustrated for as long as possible as well. Mm. So giving the ball away within seven seconds wasn't very useful. <laughs> you know, out the window. No, we usually have a good, we have a game plan that's just kind of frustrate sides and maintain our shape and make it difficult, keep the spaces between the lines tight, it makes it difficult for teams. So it's, we've we've got to games where we're nil nil half time or we're drawing half time and it's, then it's. I think our concentration levels on to get into the second half, as well as fitness levels too, because you get into half time and you think, okay, we've survived to now. We come out again, and then obviously they're much fitter than us, so mm. that's gonna that's gonna play out in the second half of games too. So that's apart from our concentration, where we're giving away silly goals sometimes. Um, mm. Our fitness levels, you can't really compare them to those of professional footballers. Yeah. I mean, if you still got a, or, um, another career as well to look at, it's sort of it's hard to focus on the football. I mean, I mean, as semi pros, but with the experience, uh, like you said, you're a relatively new nation. Um, you personally as well made said you made your debut a couple of a couple of years ago. But the more the more you're together, like you said, you're improving. The more you'll get used to it, and I'm sure you will continue to improve, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. The group's been together now for a couple of years. 
mm-hmm. mainly the main group of players have been together for a couple of years so the progression is there the only now it's those players that are getting to the end they're getting older it's bringing them in and bleeding the youngsters and getting them involved now as soon as possible but um no yeah the future the future's bright for those here who are 10, 11, 12 years old, really. If they want to make a professional career out of football, I think they'll be able to by the time they get to the age of 16, 17. Because now, as well, we've been accepted and we've got under 21s that are competing now in the next few months as yeah. well. On the 17s, under 19s. So that wasn't, that, none of that was available for me. For me, it was just like jump straight into the senior team and that was it. Uh, yeah. And for many others as well. So now, players and youngsters here, they've got a chance to develop and go through the age groups at at international level so that will help the senior structure eventually but for me unfortunately that has come a bit too late I think he's just been released by Scunthorpe but Scott Wiseman is he yeah yeah, yeah. you you play with him quite a lot yeah Scott's, Scott's I think he's just signed for Chesterfield as well ok yeah, yeah I know there's rumours about him coming or not necessarily rumours but people were sort of looking for him to come to Gillingham as well but yeah he's a, no he's a very good player honestly yeah. great lad good player he's a He's a proper professional, and he's come in, and he's when he's been around, where he hasn't been injured, he's um, he's he's a massive help to the group because mm-hmm. knows he plays week in week out. He's a full time pro, and his experience helps us as well. Even to have him at the back and control the defence is something that has helped massively in some of the games that we've played. And even things like in training, where he gives you little tips, gives you a bit of advice, where you think, oh yeah, that's been really helpful. That's a kind of experience that he brings it's a shame he's been injured the last few last few games really because we could have done with him but no he's got, I think he's gone to Chesterfield now so wish him luck hopefully his his injury or whatever heals quickly and we've got him back because he's he's a big player for us yeah yeah I imagine it would be really important to have a pro around so look into the future I mean like you said with the under 21s and stuff what are what are your personal aspirations and the sort of nation as a whole in terms of aspirations, what are, what are you and they both looking to do in the future? Personally, I think it's just try and play as many games as possible mm-hmm. <laughs> until... Just make memories. Legs go, yeah, make as many memories as possible. Keep all the newspaper cuttings, get as many shirts as you can, because at the end of the day, you look back at it and say, right, I've played against these people. Yeah. I've played against these countries. I've gone, played in front of 50,000 people, but I'm a school teacher. But as the, for the country, I think it's kind of... And us as well, we want to get that first result, that first competitive result. Uh, put us on the map I think Mm -hmm. I think we deserve it because the the work we've been putting in as well deserves it so hopefully that will come soon but for the country I think it's more in the future to kind of be a bit more competitive at the end of the day we're not going to be competing with the best in the world because our population doesn't doesn't allow us to you can just take inspiration from teams like Iceland maybe yeah the first team with under a population of a million to go to the Euros, for example, and to do really well, and to knock out England, I might as well add that in. <laughs> no, for us, it's it'll be to kind of be proud when representing your country, and hopefully with the youth setup that's starting to get better here as well, the grassroots is a massive, massive focus for, for the GFA, so hopefully they can start producing players that will go away and become professionals yeah. as well. So that will, that will eventually help the national team to to have a team with a few professionals dotted about will be useful. Yeah, but that won't be in my lifetime anyway. I'm, what, 25, maybe not eight, nine years? We'll see what we can do in that time. But yeah, it's mainly the main aim is for the for the ones, for the kids really that are coming through, that they should be the ones aspiring to be the professional footballers now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and why not? Like you said, for the future, I mean, my... Like me personally, I'm a, I'm a huge football fan. Like football's basically a big part of my life. But I mean, even just doing this, I mean, I'm sort of interviewing youth players. I'm obviously interviewing you, interviewing uh, people that work at Gillingham. But I mean, to play against some of the world's best and have all those memories when you do retire is just would be unbelievable. But that's obviously something for you to look forward to. And I mean, I've seen the pictures, and I'm going to put the pictures in as well of the shirts. And in terms of the um, the nation's aspirations. Um, I mean, it does. It does sort of sound like a good thing. I mean, they're getting more experience, and I mean, even you growing older, you may not be playing for them anymore, but you'll sort of always be able to be a fan and follow them and how the nation progresses when you're retired from the country. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Maybe go into coaching at some point. Yeah, to enjoy that side of things. At the moment, kind of focus on us. See what we can do. Not probably not looking at and play, playing the next couple of weeks with my stupid elbows broken. I'm gonna have to. It looks like I might have to miss out on the next. The next game in Cyprus. Mm-hmm. 
but we're away we're away to Belgium at the end of August so that will be an easy game to come back into <laughs> yeah so, I mean hopefully that'll be on TV and I'll hopefully give that a watch as well especially if you're involved um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about your um, your your sort of you play semi-pro how you're involved with clubs I mean obviously you were over in England for a bit were you on loan at Canterbury City is that right yes yeah so how does that sort of work do you just sort of say I'm going over there can you send me a loan somewhere over in England yeah yeah because I was well I was doing my PDC while I was with you guys at Raynham it was um, I literally spoke to the national team manager Jeff Wood and he's got quite a lot of contacts over in the UK he's he's been a goalkeeping coach at Norwich and Mm -hmm. played at certain clubs as well and he knows quite a lot of that area mm-hmm. down down there yeah. so just I said I spoke to him I was like look Jeff I'm going to be over there could you get me somewhere to play to a decent level and I told him I was going to be based in Canterbury anyway and I got in touch with Canterbury City and it was um, yeah it was it was a good time when I was there really I really enjoyed it they were really really welcoming of me as well and it helped me actually because it uh, Canterbury is what kind of broke me into the first team the difference in the league there to here is quite is quite different. It's more physical, mm-hmm. yeah, than it is here. Here it's more kind of Spanish influence st- style of football, but in the UK they yeah. are playing on those cold night Wednesday nights down at like Erith and places like that. Yeah, remember it, and you're better for it at the end after. So no, yeah. it was nice. I had a really really good time when I was there, and some really really good actually some very very good players that I was playing with there that could be playing in the, the league I'm playing in here. The standard of football in the UK is good, even when you go down into the non-leagues. Yeah, that's great. So, um, I mean, now you're at Gibraltar United, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what's that like there? No, it's good. Um, we've had a bit of a disappointing season, to be fair. Okay. And the club last year stayed up just, um, but this year the aim was kind of to, to go not be involved in a relegation battle. Yep. And... Unfortunately, we were up until the last couple of games of the season, which is a bit disappointing given the, the players that we signed. Because Gibraltar, the problem with Gibraltar United is it's the only team that's that is 100% local. Mm-hmm. So, like Bilbao in Spain, for example, that have players of the region, Gibraltar United wouldn't sign anyone from abroad, okay. any foreign players. So we are only Gibraltarian players compared to other teams which are heavily influenced by Spanish players or South American players. So. In a sense, what we do is is quite nice for the country and it's good for developing local footballers. Yeah. But it's difficult as well. Um, because we all work, first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're not, we are like a semi-pro club, whereas the majority of the clubs, maybe half of them are, we have got players that are full-time. We didn't really want to be in that scrap. We we ended up in the scrap and we did okay. We came seventh out of the ten. So mm. we've we've done okay. We did, They finished it place better so do the ninth and 10th get relegated then uh 10th goes down and ninth plays a playoff with the team that, that finishes second in the second division like in like, like what they're doing in scotland sort of thing yeah. yeah 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 so we avoided that so that's good i think we'll be looking to build on next year we've got now the club's got a much better investment we've got um a, a decent project i suppose for the next few years but yeah, no, um, it's hopefully avoiding that next year and finishing higher up in the league and you never know, we'll see. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like you said, that's really good for your nation. It sounds like you've got really good aspirations as well. We'll go on to some Twitter questions. Uh, they were okay. sent, in, sent in quite a while ago, but I've still got them. I mean, we've basically covered this already, so I'm going to adapt it a bit. But from Italian Jill, he says, what's the experience of playing international football like? So how would, how would you basically summarise it really briefly then? Uh, enjoyable yet difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very like you kind of you're starstruck the the stadiums you go to, the places you visit, the players you play against, and um, like getting an official escort to games by like armed police and stuff like that. That yeah. is like that is it in a nutshell, really. At the same time, it's it's enjoyable, but when you come off the pitch and you've been beaten seven nil or you've been whatever, you do feel disappointed. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of t- we're trying to take that disappointment now and turn it into positive results. It's it's enjoyable. So I I try to enjoy it as much as I can. Try not to daunt my daunt on it too much. Or if we get if we lose or we get thumped or whatever, because at the end of the day, in comparison, player wise, you can't really compare. So it's yeah. a matter of just enjoying it as much as possible. Does the enjoyment outweigh the difficulties at the end of the day? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like it. It takes it. It'll take a few weeks for me to sink in that I just played against um, Eden Hazard, for example, or Axel Witzel, who's just moved to China for on a contract of two hundred fifty grand a week. You know what I mean? So yeah. <laughs> it's it does take a while to sink in, but yeah, it's the enjoyment factor more than anything else. Next question from Alan Spore. I mean, we sort of covered this already, but. Um, he says, would you ever consider playing in League One in England or are you aiming higher? I mean, like you said, you're sort of on the back end. But if if something was to happen, uh, would you consider it? If a club was to approach me, I would consider it probably, yeah. Why okay. not? Because you never know. Yeah. You do something else or circumstances. I have to speak to the missus first anyway. <laughs> but no, it, yeah, it's be something I'd consider, definitely. Why not? You only live once. England or Spain or France or Italy or whatever you know what I mean it's, yeah. if an offer comes you don't just turn it down straight away you might as well have a think and then weigh up your options and see if it's the right thing to do if you so if the Gillingham rumours were true and the Gillingham approached you would you sort of look at that with a realistic possibility then yeah definitely brilliant next question from Ben Thanker he says what's your favourite colour red for Liverpool red for Let's not say Liverpool, let's say Red for Gibraltar. Okay, fair but, enough, yeah. fair enough. Red for <laughs> Okay, fair enough. John Oldfield says, sort of what we've spoken about, but I suppose this is sort of what you want rather than what might happen. He says, are you content in playing in the Gibraltar League or do you want to push for a career abroad? At the moment, I'm quite content because I know I've got a secure job and I'm enjoying myself. And The league is getting surprisingly more competitive than it some people imagine it to be as yeah. well. Yeah. Lots of clubs are bringing in foreign investment, which means they're bringing in foreign players, which means the level's getting better. Eventually, I don't know, if, if the chance, like I said before, if the chance was to come up, I'd think about it. But I'm not going to go openly to club looking for trials. I'm just going to yeah. play it by ear and see how it goes. So if China came calling on that big money contract, <laughs> you'd think about it? Definitely think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Perez, now I think, I saw you replied to this on Twitter, I'm not sure if you know him at all, but... <laughs> I do know him. He's a bastard. What has he asked? What made you think of having a haircut like Benucci? <laughs> <laughs> I've spent the majority of my time playing with long hair, so I thought, you know, what, I'm just going to cut it off. Yeah, I thought, I thought that when when I've seen older pictures of you, I thought you had longer hair. Yeah, I used to have curly long hair, so I've been kind of given all sorts of names, but I cut it a few months, well, about a month ago, and I just turned up to the changing room on the day of a game with like a shaved head yeah they were all a bit giving me grief but I scored the oh, really? like, points so they can't really say anything and then I don't know where the Bonucci name came from but that's, that's right. he's, he's not a bad player so if I get <laughs> then is Ashley Perez a sort of someone you play with then yeah he plays left back at Jib United ok fair enough and you play in midfield then and I play just to the side of him yeah so we've okay. got a good good friendship that's good good to hear final question is from Lewis Hart maybe a bit aspirational but he says uh, in many ways I suppose you're on a penalty for Gibraltar and do you take penalties are you on the list at all um, I wouldn't I wouldn't shy away from one yeah. I'd put my hand down if we need one so in a penalty shooter you'd be happy to take one of the early ones yeah yeah definitely I took, I took one well, probably the only penalty I've taken was in the in the cup semi-final here mm-hmm. for my old club and it was the the winning penalty that got us to the final and therefore to the Europa League. So, oh, really? It was a nice pressure on it. Yeah. Actually, I haven't put my name down for one because, you know, every team, all the strikers like to take pens and all that crap. So, <laughs> but if I would take a pen, I'd, if I was offered it, I'd say, yeah, I wouldn't decline it. So you're on a penalty and if you score, you take Gibraltar to the World Cup, so maybe um, sometime in the future and you're uh, maybe drawing one or win a game you need the win to, to go to the World Cup. Uh, what, what's running through your head at this time? Put it top right. Top right. <laughs> are, you, are you left footed? Yeah. Yeah, so you just sort of look to put it straight in the top right. Top right, top right. That's, what, every, that's where I take my pens in training and then that, that last penalty, that's the one. I, that's where I put it. I don't change. We'll, we'll hope any of your future opponents aren't listening to this then. Yeah, um, I don't, I'm pretty sure that um, Courtois doesn't listen to these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll have to kind of skip that and edit it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if next time you're playing Germany and you put a penalty top right and Manuel Neuer saves it, I know, I know where he's exactly. It's come from you. So, would you be nervous, or are you more confident in that situation? No, I'm a bit nervous. Yeah, when you take a penalty, you're always nervous. In a big game, I suppose, and training is different. But if there is a bit of pressure on it, you do feel a, you do feel the nerves. But it's just 
just hit, hit and hope most of the time. Do you do you feel the nerves quite a lot when you're playing the bigger teams like Belgium? No, nope, at all. Really? No, I don't. I just try to go out and enjoy enjoy the occasion. There's no point in getting worked up about playing against Belgium because at the end of the day they're Belgium and you're Gibraltar. So yeah. I don't. I, obviously, you do get a few butterflies at the beginning of a game. That's normal, but they don't really last for long. I was truly nervous was when I was making my debut. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're um, if you're going to games really not expecting to win, and then um, you're nervous about it, and you're going to enjoy it less than what you would if you weren't, sort of thing. Yeah, for games like that, for us, there's no pressure really. So it's kind mm. of going out and enjoying them as much as you can. Don't get worked up too much about it. Like even now, like the, the whole Benteke assist thing, I don't really get too too wound up about it now. I just kind of have a laugh, have a joke because yeah. stuff happens all the time. I suppose. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. Not, not that often, but in football, people make mistakes, I suppose. What was the final score in the game against Belgium? 5-0? 6-0, I think. 6-0. So, like like I said, it doesn't make too much of a difference, but if you look at, say, um, something springs to mind as Robert Green in the 2010 World Cup when he let the ball through his legs. Oh, like, yeah. People yeah. making mistakes, that matters so much more, sort of thing. So it's not really worth getting worked up about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that, that brings an end to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. It was really interesting. I mean... Obviously spoken to you before, but it's real. I learned a lot, definitely. Good, no, 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 no problem whatsoever. You're welcome. Do you want to just say your Twitter? Maybe someone can f- follow you on Twitter. Anyone that's listening. Jamie Bossy twenty one Twitter and Instagram. Get on it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So hope you enjoyed the video. Follow all the links in the description below. Follow Jamie on Instagram and Twitter, like he said. Please like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Perfect. Thank you.